was probably one of the biggest people in the world. Like okay. I was huge. I enjoyed hurting people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I think fitness could be one of the most destructive avenues there is. I don't think enough people understand the dangers of today's world. The fitness influencer space. My biggest gripe with the fitness world is when you try and sell dreams to people. Sam Sulek, what are your thoughts on him? So much corruption and deception, I think is the word. Is every athlete on steroids? You are going to be pushed towards there. It didn't mean enough to me to try and kill myself to win a trophy. You introduce steroids into the combat sport, you've got a problem. And then you've got people like The Rock. Is The Rock on steroids? Well, years ago, yes. They're trying to bring in the use of drugs for the Olympics. How many fighters do you think are clean? Probably not very many. That was an absolute nightmare. You're referring to the Iranian health? Yeah. The whole mess of that drove me insane. I hit a crazy depression. Hospitalized, depressed, wow. anorexic, body fat, 1%, put on drips. That, that level of depression, complete breakdown. That's why I said my superpower was failing when I was young, because I refused to feel like that again. I confront the world's scariest man on fitness scams, steroid myths, and life as a Hollywood actor. So you had a very interesting path to, to get you to where you are today. Start off with cricket, I'm right in, in thinking? Yes, it, my, my first professional um, sport was cricket. I've played many sports before that, but the, yeah. the one I really excelled in was, was definitely cricket for sure. And I assume you grew up playing? Yeah, yeah. I my dad actually played cricket, and it was it was. I think it was one of those boyhood moments where you kind of just want to do what your dad does and 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 try and impress impress the parents. And and I realised from the age of about seven that I was actually better than what my dad was at that time okay. as an adult. So it was <laughs> it was one of those sports that just came very natural. I had a very good eye, um, holding a bat and hitting the ball was something that was just seemed normal to do and, and then I picked up the ball and, and I started bowling and I was very fast and very loose and wild but it was it was a natural talent um, something that came very easy and, and I think because it did come easy I could progress and I enjoyed being good at something I think it was the first mm -hmm. time that I could I could sit there and be proud of myself and and, and and at a young age, when you're not massively academic, and, and I think the the reason for that was more so the boredom in the classroom than anything else. Yeah, to to have something that I could excel at and see my parents be proud of was was definitely a a driver of uh, for, for myself. On top of that, did you really enjoy it, or was it more the element of like I'm really good at um, this and I enjoy being good at it? I think I enjoyed being good at it. To be yeah. honest, and, and this sounds really bad, but I enjoyed hurting people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was an opening bowler. I was a fast bowler, and and it just really <laughs> amused me hitting people, which sounds terrible as you get older, and you you kind of think that's not the purpose of the that's game. Part, that's part of the gig as a fast bowler, though. Right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for you know, for me when I was growing up, I remember watching some of the older guys. I was, I'm sure there's an Australian bowler called Murph Hughes. He was a really aggressive bowler, and then there was you know, like some Courtney Walsh and um, Ambrose and. They were just always aggro, mm. and, and they were they were trying to hit the batsman rather than hit the wickets. I was like, this this looks like a good game, and and it uh, it really did sort of excite me to to see how many ribs I could break. So <laughs> that, that was kind of kind of what I enjoyed about the game was okay. was the do you know what it was? It was the one on one combat. Which okay. sounds really weird when you're talking about cricket because yeah, a yeah. lot of people that don't play the sport kind of have this. Um, image of cricket as being a very softly soft um, gentleman's game on, yeah. on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but the reality is when you're growing up in a competitive environment and you're, you were very um, ambitious and talented and also very masculine um, energies around, there's a lot of competition. There's, there's actually quite a lot of sledging. There's a lot of, mm. there's a lot of uh, verbals, a lot of, a lot of ego. Um, and that was kind of what, that was the exciting part for me. The one-on-one yeah. -on -one and the, the, the battle between me and the batsman. Do you think you got as much out of your cricket career as, as you would have wanted? No, no, definitely didn't succeed in the, in the career. But what that did do was it gave me the superpower that I now have, which sounds a very egotistical and arrogant thing to yeah. say, but within that, 
if you understand what I mean by it, is that I have this burning desire to constantly improve and to mm. try and mask past failure. So then when I do hit times in life that become difficult, I realize or pull back memories of failure and use that to drive me forward. Yeah. And I think that has definitely helped me when it comes to the, the last 15, 20 years of success has been, I wouldn't call it fear, probably more anger from giving up. Mm, okay. And knowing how that feels and how, how disappointed I was within myself for, for quitting something that I was very good at. And that's, that's kind of how I feel it ended. I mean, it ended with an injury and an illness, kind of. Yeah. Um, but I could have fought back from that if I really wanted to. So you think you to. used that potentially as a bit of an excuse at the time? It wasn't even an excuse. It was it was basically to say up yours to the world, which was weird. So the way it, what happened was I got a very bad groin injury. Um, I had a very bad, well, not a bad breakup, but a breakup with yeah. my first girlfriend who decided to, to to walk out and whatnot, which was is what it is. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't looking back. It was just a relationship. But when you're that age, at seventeen, eighteen, yeah, it's the the be all and end all of everything. And then yeah. you have on top of that, my granddad passed away with cancer, and it was just mm. so many things at once hit. And then I got glandular fever, and uh, long story short, lost lost my place in the team. The promised contract never happened because of an injury and I was told to go away, work and come back and you'll be, you know, we'll see where you are then. And I think it was an element of ego and an element of, of sacrifice so much of my life to this sport and to be kicked out, uh, how it felt, just kicked on the side. And it was like they were kind of asking me to prove myself again after all I'd given. I was like, oh, mm. no, no, no way. Okay. And from that day forward, I never played again, never never watched a game, never spoke to anyone around the sport. So I've gone really? from eight years of being obsessed with some something and it being the only thing that was made me stand out from everyone else to the next day, just divorced. Wow. And and, and I hit a crazy depression, like a really big depression. Um, and I think what I went through then kind of really gave me the energy to be who I am today. Wow. That's very interesting. Okay, so had you already started bodybuilding at that age? No. That came later? No, bodybuilding was a reaction from what happened after cricket. So it was in the immediate aftermath, effectively, you got into within, lifting weights? Within six to 12 months. Okay. Yeah. So we, we finished, I think I finished cricket when I was around about 19. Yeah. Um, and then for five to six months, just couldn't get out of the house. Mm -hmm. When I say depressed, I mean- That's really like, depressed. Like hospitalized, depressed, wow. anorexic body fat 1%, um, nearly been taken to hospital to put on drips, that that level of depression. Um, complete breakdown, seeing therapist, and then realizing that the, the position I was in was from me trying to take control of my life again without realizing it. And the only thing I could control at that point in time was what I ate and what I did. Mm -hmm. And what I did was training and what I ate was food. So I kind of that was the only two things I had control over. Yeah. Hence where the lack of eating came from. I think it was, it was kind of self harm in okay. a bizarre way. The bodybuilding or before you started? No, before that? the bodybuilding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, so, that period of six months where you've got to, I just stopped eating. Yeah. Okay. Um, carried on training, which was really weird. Carried on doing cricket training. I, no, I couldn't because I, I, the injury I got was quite a severe one to my groin. So I couldn't mm. do anything which, was too dynamic. So okay. obviously being a bowler, I couldn't do that. But everything else around it, I carried on doing. Okay. Um, whether it be bike or um, swimming or weights, right. whatever it was. Um, but to such an extreme level that it, it really was like a self-harm mm. sort of, it was just lost. And I think for me, when I get lost, I try to escape through fitness. You okay. And that was, that was subconsciously what happened. And then um, I think the whole food thing for me was kind of trying to prove to myself that I could do anything I put my mind to. So trying to survive off no food was quite a good challenge. Right, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you haven't had a professional fight, have you? 
No, no. But you've come close. I've come close on so many occasions. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. And there's been, uh, there was a chance of, of having a fight in March just past. And then there was a chance of having a fight um, next month. But it's, the world is full of this and it's empty promises. Okay. And and for me, I don't have time to to mess around and wait for 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 these things to come through. The the problem with the fight world now for me, I can't fight for free and I can't fight for fun. Because it's going to okay. be too damaging. Right. right. It'd be too damaging for my career. If I sign for a fight, I need to make sure I get paid for it. Because there's so many risks yeah. that come with that. There could be injury. There could be humiliation. Mm. There could be um, there, 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 there could be negative press. There could be anything which would be damaging to brand. It'd be damaging to yeah. to you. There's there's a, there's a there's a lot to look at at what could potentially happen on a fight when you already have a platform. Yeah. Right. So for me, I'm like I don't mind fighting, but there needs to be a a nice goal at the end of it. Otherwise, I'm just going to stay focused on film. Yeah. You can't go into a fight without a training camp. Yeah. Right? Because if you do, you're going to, one, you're going to humiliate yourself and look stupid. Or two, you're going to get hurt. Either of those things aren't, aren't ideal. So you're looking around about 12 weeks shortest for a training camp, which takes 12 weeks out of your career to act, mm. which then also doesn't allow you to sign for a film until the fight's over because of risk of injury. So for me, I've got to put my acting career on hold for six months. Okay. Now, six months worth of work has to be covered yeah. straight away. Then there has to be, this could take me away from the acting work and could actually damage me as, as an actor because people now see me as a performing monkey rather than a, right. a, a you know someone who's trying to be seen as a, a legitimate actor. And you're now more of a, like a YouTuber type yeah. individual which is fine got nothing about against that at all but my career is 100 down the, the film world so there's there's a lot of things in there that that will impact my decisions if someone's willing to put the money on the table and it's in the bank and it's in a holding bank i'm i'm ready to fight okay if someone says you can fight but we'll do it on pay-per-view after the right i'm not interested in that why were you open to the idea of a fight in the first place? Is it something you actually want to do? Four years ago, yes. Right. Four years ago, I was in a very different position career-wise as I am now. Okay. Um, four years ago, it seemed like fun. It was something that I really wanted to do and there was talks of it. And it just never happened. It never happened. We could never find the right opponent. And when we found an opponent, it turned out to be a fake person. And that was a that was an absolute nightmare. You're referring to the Iranian Hulk? Yeah. Yeah, like it just, the whole mess of that drove me insane. So initially, going back four years ago, I signed a deal with KSW, which are a Polish MMA outfit. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of like celebrity fights. And that at the time was great. It was, it was good money for where I was then. Yeah. And then I got offered Fast and Furious. I was like, well, I need to do that. So that took me out for six months. Then I was going to fight and then we had COVID. Okay. So there was no, no yep. way we were going to fight then. And then I did another couple of films and then KSW came back asking to fight, but then it didn't make sense financially because I'd already done four massive films on the back end of that. So it didn't make sense for them and it didn't make sense for me because what they were offering, I couldn't afford not to do the acting work. Yeah. Then there was another opportunity to fight this Iranian guy and the money was supposed to be really good. Um, and he was supposed to be this huge freak and it was going to be one of the biggest fights of the century and blah, blah, blah. I sent me the photos and I was like, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. And there was a, I don't really want to go back into it all, but there was a lot that happened behind the scenes verbally uh, between himself and me, which turned out not to be him. And it was someone else sending messages on his behalf, which okay. were very uh, uh red flaggy let's say um what 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 way would you mean uh just an element of threatening and also 
it, it involved my children. Oh, okay. yeah. But wow. it wasn't him. Right, okay. Yeah. Right. Now, the problem is, at the time, I thought it was. Mm. So that whole thing became an absolute mess. Uh, and then, then when I was in Dubai and I lost my temper with the push, that was where it all came from. Then I realized it wasn't him and it kind of backfired. <laughs> so it was, it was one of those moments where I thought, well, I've just wasted six months of my life okay. prepping for this fight that's just never going to happen. And I think that's the problem with this, this sort of new world of YouTube slash professional fighters is it's so temperamental and, and so, um, well, you, you understand the world of marketing and advertising and reality and fake. And it's like, what's true, what's not true, what numbers are true and what numbers are false. And one thing that you often see is anything that's new, and this is all really very new, is there are a lot of cowboys 100%. and there's a lot of people taking advantage of yeah. stuff because there yeah. aren't the rules and regulations no. and best practices no. and all that no. sort of stuff. No. It? And so that for me, you know, we've had we've had quite long discussions with my manager and agents and so on. And we've decided that unless that money is big and on the table and in a, in, in, in a bank, we, we, we're not going down that route anymore. Is there a fear that it would hurt your brand if you lost? Uh, there is that. There is that. I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, anyone's, everyone's human. There's always a chance of winning or losing when it's a real fight. Yeah. I mean, there is a, there is a possibility of, of, of damaging the brand for sure. I mean, is that something that would stop me fighting? Not, not if the money was good. Because mm. there is the part of me, the sports person, that really does want to have a, a fight. To test yourself. 100%. Yeah. And, and also, I think it'd be fun. Like, I've done, I've done lots of sparring. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, I've, I've, I'm not, uh, I'm not someone that would shy away from a fight in, I don't mean that in a street way. I just mean in a competitive way, mm -hmm. but it has to also make sense. Yeah. You know, it has to make sense. I would love the challenge of a real fight if there was a real reward. Mm. Otherwise now that it's, it doesn't motivate me to just go and fight for free there's no point i've got no ego i've got nothing to prove there's no there's no win in there for me the only win for me would be to be able to secure my children's future yeah so i'll get back to my conversation with martin in a second before i do i just want to ask you a very quick favor and that's to click the subscribe button so i'm really proud of the community that we're building with this channel but currently 97.5 percent of people that are watching the videos on this channel aren't subscribed now we want to have the biggest and best guests on possible to do that we need more subscribers and we need your support so if you could just click that subscribe button that would be massively appreciated let's get back to the show I want to ask you about the fitness influencer space. Mm -hmm. We talked on earlier online about there being many distractions and obviously there's some good information, but there's yep. terrible. a lot of bad information as well. I love a lot. Yeah. My Does biggest that... pet hate. Okay. I was going to say, does mm -hmm. that frustrate you? Yeah. hundred percent. I'm a, I'm old school. I'm very old school in, in a sense of if it's not broke, why are you trying to fix it? Okay. And I think the biggest problem with the world today and especially the fitness space is there's so much that's already out there that works. Then mm. in order to sell and constantly keep selling, you have to confuse the consumer to resell the same story. Right. So make something that's established sound like something different. 100%. Mm. Like when, whenever you watch an influencer that, can't put his words into layman's terms hmm. and tries to bamboozle people with terminology and numbers and macro this and macro that and timing of this and timing it, it drives me insane because the reality is fitness is very simple hmm. healthy eating is very simple curing obesity is very simple adding muscle not so simple, but the basics, very simple. If you put that out on social media, <laughs> you're not selling, no. you're not selling to many people. Yeah. And this is the thing with, with, with uh, the fitness influencer space that drives me insane is when there's so many new this, new that, fastest this, fastest that, try this arm, try that arm, try. 
oh, let's do the the blah de blah workout. It's just, it's just, it's been done. It's so overdone now as well. And and the other thing that frustrates me like hell is the amount of false advertising through imagery that's been edited or enhanced or shot a certain way now you know obviously in the film world we do it all the bloody time yeah but you know what you get there my biggest frustration is you, when you're not pretending that's reality are no you? exactly it's a fantasy it's a fantasy world my my biggest gripe with the fitness world is when you try and sell dreams to people and you're same with the supplement world. There's a lot of supplements that I look at and I'll just cringe because they're, they're useless. There's a lot of supplements that I do genuinely rate. Yeah. Um, but I think that's true in everything in life. And, and, you know, especially you coming from a marketing background, your job is to make something old exciting. So how do we rebrand that? How do we make that fresh? How do we jazz this up so that, you know, the same people will buy the same old same old rubbish, but think it's it's different. We all do it. But when you're in it, it you kind of, you see past it. Hmm. And for me in the fitness world, I see past it all. And what's even more infuriating is it's people that don't know what they're talking about trying to sell. And and it's it's kids that will try and sell a muscle build program that, and like four stone ringing wet. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's not the evidence there. Yeah, it's like, like oh, really? <laughs> you sure you, this is the program to, 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 to use? And, and I, I'm all up for people enjoying fitness. Right? I'm all up for people wanting to become influencers if that's what they want to do and so on and so forth. But there's an element of honesty that needs to come with that. And there's an... I think the biggest problem today is everyone's trying to be seen. Okay. Now, how do I get seen? Because if I just talk basic knowledge and tell people how 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 someone told them 20 years ago how to get the results, no one's going to listen. Yeah. I need to make it more extreme or I need to make it sound different. I need to do this. I need to do that, which they do. And they do need to do that to sell because no one's buying something they've already brought. But then you also for someone who knows what they're talking about, it just screams, oh, it's just frustrating. <laughs> it reminds me of a marketing line that's, um, don't sell better, sell new. Yeah. When better's really what people need and what they want, mm -hmm. but they're far more likely to be have their attention grabbed and pay attention to something that is 100%. new because they want the shortcut and they think that yep. the new thing exactly. might be the quick, easy shortcut, whereas... The just do it better is hard work and 100%. requires discipline. It's exactly that is exactly it. Yeah, people want the easy option to buy and purchase, and they mm. will be lied to over and over and over again, and then they get frustrated because they don't get the results. Yeah, and and that's the that's the thing. I think the problem is that people. We, I I came back to it before. It's an element of laziness. Mm. They're willing to spend and pay heavy. So do the work. easy and quick, even though it comes without evidence of proof of work. So someone who's exploded in the fitness influencer space is Sam Sulek. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on him? I, I don't know. Oh, very weirdly, I'm training with him tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. <laughs> what are the odds of that? I, but, well, this is going to sound even more bizarre. I genuinely didn't really know. I, I had seen a picture of him. I try and keep myself off yeah as much social media as possible because i've got three children <laughs> i have numerous businesses i have a wife i have parents and i am very busy mm -hmm. i'm prepping for a film i don't have the time to allow myself to be distracted on social media and that's not saying that social media is good or bad it's not saying that this this kid is good or bad i have no idea. Um, I know who he is. Yep. I don't really know why he's exploded. And I don't mean that in a horrible way. It sounds very bitchy. I don't mean it like that. I just don't know what he talks about. Yeah. Um, or, or what 
he his target audience is. He's obviously very likable. Um, one of his teammates messaged me yesterday asking if they could use my gym mm. to do some training, and and they said, "Oh, Sam's come in." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I realised who he meant because I was like, "Why does he keep mentioning this, Sam?" So, so yeah, I'll wow. get to meet him tomorrow. I'm sure he's a lovely kid. It's um he's an interesting case study for anyone that's interested in you know growing on YouTube or growing online because he has, I mean, eighteen months ago I'm not sure he had a presence at all and now he has an enormous one. He's mm -hmm. done it incredibly quickly, um, so, so yeah, so that's very interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. um, one of the, the sort of big elephant in the room when it comes to to fitness influencers that doesn't really get talked about are steroids and mm -hmm. performance enhancing drugs. Do you think more people should be more open about that in that space? I, it's a very difficult subject for for the industry in whole. And I think the problem is, is that you could ask that question in a different way to a lot of professions. Okay, interesting. Do you think you should talk about the use of cocaine within different professions, such mm. as banking? Right. Such as nurses and doctors. Mm. And then people are be very shocked with that. But if you actually look and research into it, there's a huge problem with um, different drugs in different professions. Not so much for the kick or the energy, just to keep the poor buggers awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, it, there's a, there's, there's, of the shifts being, there's a huge, yeah. huge drug problem in many professions. And certain professions will carry different um, related problems. Now, I think in whole, the fitness industry gets hammered for, for this. And rightly so. I'm not defending it. The biggest problem is that they don't test the events. Okay. Right? Like, like bodybuilding events. Yeah, they don't test bodybuilding. Right? Yeah. Now, one of the main reasons that I never got competitive was because I was not willing to do what they'd have to do to get on stage. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that I agree or disagree with anything I'm saying from a personal point of view, it didn't mean enough to me to try and kill myself to win a trophy. Yeah. Right? Now, that could have been a very different uh, outcome had I not have started succeeding in the film world. Interesting. Because I would have wanted to achieve something. Yeah. Now, the problem is if you've got five people on stage and out of those five people, four of them are on uh, PEDS, performance enhancing drugs the chances are the one that's not is not going to place <laughs> yeah so then if you have an element of competitive competitiveness inside you you are going to be pushed towards there the other problem then becomes that the drugs aren't actually illegal in every single country mm. so some countries certain drugs are legal some countries they're not and then you start going down the route of, well, it's not illegal to own them or use them, but it's illegal to sell them. Okay. Right. So how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> they get dropped from the sky. <laughs> yeah. But, but then the other problem is because they are illegal to sell. I mean, it's, the rules on, on drugs have changed a lot the last couple of years. We've been testosterone. So you can now do TRT. Yeah. Right. That's the same thing really it's not the same thing in essence of adding mass amounts of muscle but it's still a testosterone which in, increases performance and the way that you'd have to get that is go for a doctor's test and you'd have to be proven to have a lower testosterone and they would see it's a hormone replacement now the problem with the fitness industry is because it's illegal to use but not illegal to take it's a very bizarre sort of gray area that people are willing to sort of risk themselves taking stuff that's not manufactured properly that comes from backstreet labs that no one really knows how it's made and, and what's in it and what the compounds are um and it's just an absolute minefield for individuals especially young kids um and i think it's a very it's a very interesting question it's a very dangerous area because People are self-medicating um, mm. with not bad intentions. 
Do you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to make themselves better and they're not, they're not really using it as a, as a drug that you'd use uh, recreationally. They obviously feel bad about themselves. They want to look better. They want to feel better. And they're, they're using drugs to help create that image that's been created falsely on social media over the last 20 years and mainstream media with how men should look, how women should look, the pressures of external marketing. Um, you know, if you were to, if I was to say to you as a marketing professional, right, I want you to go and sell this product. It's a, it's a product that is going to make men look great. And it's a product that's going to make men successful. It's a product that's going to attract women towards men. What type of man are you going to use on that? Mm. Yeah. You can, I think everyone's You're got gonna a, make an image sure in their he's mind. good of, looking, he's chiseled, he's yeah. got abs. So now all of a sudden, you, you know, you're reading the old magazines or you're looking at the old uh, fitness mags, your FHM, you're loaded, and then you go into your fitness stuff as whatever they the were at the time. And you've got young kids who are already feeling crap about themselves, going through puberty and looking at these models who are the ideal and they are photoshopped. They are that have been dieted down to the point of of collapsing. Mm. And then they've got a professional setup, they've got all the lighting, they've got professional cameras, they've got the angles, they've got the oil. And we're putting this image in front of people going, that's how you should look as a man. Mm. So then you've got all these these kids going, well, I'm training six times a week, I'm eating well, and I just don't look anything like that. So you're kind of pushing them into this depression because they're not ticking the box that they should. And then they're, they're starting to get people around the gym environment, educating them, oh, well, you could lose body fat if you were to do this, or you could add some more muscle if you do that. So you kind of, you've got this weird, horrible, vicious circle of, of creating this false sense of identity, which, which the youngsters should be, be looking up to, but no way for them to do it naturally. I guess, so you've got people like, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who have mm -hmm. been very open and honest about yeah. what they've taken. And I imagine that would help with exactly what you described. People going, okay, well, he looked like that, but that's because of X, Y, and Z. And then you've got people like The Rock, who have, everyone sort of speculates that he probably is on something, but people don't talk about. So do you, do you think someone like him should say, yeah, I, I am on stuff? And No, probably, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the problem lies deeper than individuals. Okay. Uh, you know, the you can look back through the whole of time and say, well, there was, there was individuals with good bodies, there's individuals with bad bodies. I think the, the real problem is where do we stand on, on it? You know? Where do you stand on the... Ethically, do you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you're, if you're okay with promoting the outlook of something... Yeah and making money out of that and selling on top of that, then there's got to be an element of support around that. Because... Hmm, okay. It, it, it just, it comes down to being more responsible with the people that can control it. And, and I, you know, I'm, I don't really want to go down this rabbit hole of who is, who isn't, and what is and what shouldn't. But what I will say is there's a lot of influential people out there and there's a lot of influential um, youngsters out there who could really do with more advice and more guidance and more hope, mm -hmm. you know? I think because we've destroyed so much in this world and where we are, there's so many people who are willing to roll the dice. Okay, they feel hopeless and therefore yeah. take What's, an extra risk with their health. 100%. They perhaps shouldn't do. 100%. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and I think it, it, it's not really the... To blame one person or one type of person or, or, or one... Um, I think there's probably like eight or nine elements. Okay. When you were up at 160 kilos... Yes. Yeah. Were you taking a risk with, with your health? Were you well, taking I was 160 to, kilos, to so I was eating excessive amounts of food and I was stupidly over... Even though I was muscular, I was overweight. 
just he- just, just heavy literal just weight. being heavy in itself people don't realize people always presume that you know you've got to do excessive amounts of drugs and this and that and it, it really it's not that it's food you can take all the drugs in the world okay if you're not eating it makes no difference right okay Right, the, the 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 biggest thing you've got to do is eat. Now, the the problem with eating um, large amounts of food is you are heavy. If you're heavy with muscle or you're heavy with fat, it's massive stress on the heart. Yeah, yeah. Still got to fuel it. Still got to pump it. It's still got to get you around, and um, and that's the biggest risk of being heavy is the impact that the weight has on your system. The biggest risk it has, the amount of food you're eating, the amount of digestion issues you could come up against, um, the type of foods you eat, you're eating a lot of red meat and so on and so forth. I think anyone, I think anyone who takes sport excessively is playing with their health because you look at the footballers. Yeah. How many footballers are having heart attacks? And they push themselves so hard. 100%. Do you think they're clean? Do you think there's a lot of PEDs in sports like football? What do you think? I think... Okay, let me ask you this. No, go on. I, I, I'm happy to answer that bit. Um, I think I would be surprised if footballers, most footballers aren't on something mm-hmm. and it's being masked. 100%. Yeah. But in my opinion, because how much money is involved in football? Yeah. Right, yeah, I'll throw one at you. Okay. Fighting. Mm. How many fighters do you think are clean? <laughs> at the highest level probably not very many there's a really interesting way of getting around that which is when you retire the random drug tests stop yeah oh I see so you got one temporary I'm, reti- I'm not saying temporary that. retirement <laughs> really <laughs> Well, you retire and then you have a comeback fight. Oh, that's an interesting <laughs> way to se- do we've it. We've seen a few of those comebacks. Yeah. Fights. <laughs> and normally these comeback fights will come back after an injury mm. or a lag of performance or, or something of some sort. The, the reality is right. If you're willing to sacrifice every second of your life to be the best at something. Yeah. And you come second. <laughs> and someone says, you oh, know, blah, blah, blah's doing this and blah, blah, blah's won. Yeah. Let's look at, it's not, it's not even for, it's every sport in the world. Like, you'd have to be seriously naive to think that cheating, and it is, steroid use in sports is cheating. There's no, there's no two ways about it. Steroid use in a recreational setting, for me, I think it's as good or as bad as drinking or taking recreational drugs. Sure, I it's can see that. It's your personal choice. You're not hurting yeah. me. Right? If you, this is why I don't really like having opinions on people because mm-hmm. to say if or he is or isn't on steroids with The Rock, it's none of my business. Okay. Is he or isn't he drinking alcohol? It's none of my business. Is he or isn't he taking recreational drugs? It's none of my business. He's not hurting me. Yes, he could be influencing how kids want to look, but so is everyone else. Yep. So is everyone else. And in, in other ways in as well. In different ways. At yeah. 100%. You know, let's, let's go down. Let's go down business. Yeah. You know, how? Let's go Boris Johnson. <laughs> What's more harmful? Wanting to look like The Rock or wanting to... to to be like Boris Johnson within business and morals. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. That's interesting. It's a, just a different way to look at it. It's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's very easy to pick on one aspect, but then it's, well, really there's, there's so much corruption and deception, I think is the word, in everything that we do. You know, there's deception in your world. In, Absolutely. In the world of marketing, deception is 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 massively up there. Yeah. It's the same thing as 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 individuals that are um physically different. Yeah. And in a place of power. It's the same thing, really. 
it's then that's what I mean. It's it's hard to blame one element. Yeah. For me, it's kind of a mixture of a lot. But it's trying to make it as safe as possible for the guys, the, the guys that will be hurt and influenced the most. Mm. Because it's the it's the it's those people that don't know what they're doing that will be influenced the most. And it will be most harmful. Yeah. They're, they're, those are the ones that are most at risk. With professional sports, do you think if all these guys are on stuff anyway, should we just get rid of the rules and let them have Have you not seen that? what they're trying to do with the Olympics? Uh, I don't know the specifics. Don't quote me on this. And okay. I know we are being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty sure they're trying to bring in the use of drugs within the Olympics. Okay. I, I, I heard... With, within the rules. With Yeah, I heard something within the last week about this. It's definitely some sport. I'm sure it was the Olympics. Okay. Um, now, there's two ways to look at that. One, it would probably be safer. Yeah. I've heard people say that about the Tour de France, for example, that it's so strenuous that actually some stuff might be healthier for them. That and they're going to use anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah. So where are they getting it from? Yeah, yeah. Because the chances are it's black market. Yeah. So if you can if you can make it safer for individuals and they can be monitored and they can be tested and they can have the blood work done and okay, you can use X, Y, and Z, but you've got to make sure that this, this, and this is clean, then that would that would make it safer. But you've got to look at a lot more than just that. You introduce steroids into a combat sport, you've got a problem. Right. You've got a big problem. Inflict more damage. 100% inflict more damage, but also the individuals would have internal um issues and markers potentially from the use of drugs which would make their blood pressure higher which would make an impact worse which would make the joints may become a different there's there's a lot okay. to to consider with contact sports mm. i mean i i i'm not i i don't think it will happen overnight but i wouldn't be surprised if they didn't introduce certain drugs into sports because let's be honest right there's more than one reason to take a steroid Okay. Okay. There's a reason they use steroid within hospitals. Yeah. Right. If you have a really bad injury as an athlete and your knee gets smashed into pieces, if you were to have an operation and so on and so forth, the recovery process mm. would be so much better yeah. with the use of certain, I don't know exactly which ones. Yeah. Get, yeah. You know, I'm not about to quote which ones are better. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but there are certain drugs which will increase the speed of recovery, increase yeah. the increase the quality of recovery. Now, if you're using those drugs for that, is that a, is that a bad thing, or is it actually helping someone prolong their career mm. and heal? Just and make heal. sure it heals right. Hundred so percent. It's not hundred percent. You know, there's so that for me, I don't think there should be. Um, I don't think there should be necessarily a ban on people that decide to do a steroid or a something post injury. Yeah. As long as they're not becoming stronger and better after the use of it, but they're actually just becoming the best version that they can now with, with the injury. I, for, for me, that kind of is a common sense thing. Mm. If they're using it to become enhanced, then you've got a different, yeah, a different twist. I guess sometimes that's hard to measure, but you wouldn't be able to measure it. That's the problem. That's yeah, it's difficulty. Um, going back to the fitness influencers, do you see yourself as one? No. Okay. Even no. though you have massive social media followings, yeah. I mean, okay, so uh, something else I wanted to mention, uh, wanted to ask: Where do those social media followings come from? Is that from the acting work? Is that from stuff you've done on, say, Instagram, for example? I, I don't really know. To be honest, I think it's a combination of everything, and and, yeah. and I think the <sighs> the reason I say no to the fitness influencer is, yeah, my profession is acting now, mm. right, and and. I don't spend any time creating quality content for yeah. the fitness um, market. 
this not something that I want to have time or to have a, a real passion to do. Okay. Because I'm of the thought the thought process that it's been done. Okay. Yeah. I am more than happy to put stuff up to motivate people and to help, you know, in, always in the gym again, he's doing, to show them. Yeah. So um, don't sell better, sell new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to show them what it takes to get results. Yeah. You're happy to show them the better. Yeah. You don't want to try and fabricate I don't need to them show new. them new. You know yeah. how to do it. You're just not doing it. Yeah. So I'm happy to show them that I'm doing it. But for me, I just, I'd be so bored of, that being re, your main re gig. Re re rewriting the same thing over and over and over again, because it's not, like I said, it's not difficult. But the problem of being an influencer is you can't just put the same thing up. Yeah. So you have to create. Yeah. Okay. So you see yourself as an actor, but you are sharing things on your social sharing platforms. Sharing my life. That, that's a yeah. huge part of your life is, 100%. is fitness and yeah. lifting yeah. weights. And I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I do work with a company who are, very much in the fitness space. Yeah. Um, a supplement company. I mean, they'd probably see me as a fitness influencer, but to myself, I don't. Yeah. yeah. I don't see myself as, maybe I influence people to stay healthy. Yeah. But I don't necessarily put out detailed information and, yeah. you know, there's, there's nothing that I really do to, that people could follow obsessively and, and get results apart from the mindset. Hmm. That's that's definitely something that I do do, um, because I think there's an, there's a part of me that I enjoy that because it makes me become accountable to myself. Okay, and I've stopped post on Instagram to please other people. Yeah, okay. which is so nice, <laughs> a freeing feeling. It's so nice to be there. Yeah, I don't look at likes, I don't look at comments, I don't look at anything. I post what I want to post because it's my life, and if they enjoy it, great. If they don't enjoy it. And on Instagram, I believe you've got 4.5 million followers. So that's a huge audience. It'd be very easy to get obsessed with, mm -hmm. oh, I put this out and it got this interaction versus yep. put this out, I got this mm -hmm. interaction. Yep. I, I, for me, don't get me wrong, I was lost in that rabbit hole. For a while. 100%. Yeah, okay. I was absolutely lost in that rabbit hole. Mm. And it was so depressing. Right. Because you're posting about your life and you're then going, oh, no, people don't like that part of my life. I'll stop <laughs> okay. posting. And yeah. so for me now, the way that I look at social media is it's a, it's a, it's a diary of the best parts of my day for my children to see when I'm not there. Mm. Oh, interesting. That's a nice way of framing mm. it. Yeah. That's the easiest way. Especially if you're away on set and stuff. Then. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, it, and it, it really is an interesting life that I live, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And also yeah. for me, I can, because I'm so busy and 24 seven, I can go through yeah oh well, i forgot i did that i forgot i went there <laughs> i forgot i did this and that's that's what i enjoy social media for and i, and, and I think that's where we should be it's probably that was probably the original intention that was the purpose of yeah, it yeah yeah and, it, and it's now blown up into this huge platform where it's so over overused mm. and there's I, th I think the biggest problem with social media is that people actually believe it Okay. Yeah. You know, you're not going to post up a row you've had with your missus. <laughs> you're not going to post up the fact you're late on your payment. Not unless you want it to be your last one. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not real. Yeah. Okay. It's not real. And too many people out there think it is and judge their life based on other people's. And, and that's the, that's the thing with social media for me. It's great in the right place. It's great when it's used correctly. It's great when it's used to enhance, but there is so much that it can become uh, a negative space, but that's like anything in life. Yeah. In all honesty, I think because social media is so new, we're still finding the potholes. Yeah, I agree. You almost use fitness, as you say, as escapism. Yeah, hundred percent. But obviously a lot of people choose far more destructive avenues. You say that. I think fitness could be one of the most destructive avenues there is. Okay. I really do because what you do with fitness, if you if you do it wrong, is you can burn your body out so fast. Um, you know, if you if you really do overtrain how people can overtrain, 
you end up breaking down the body internally mm. and you end up giving yourself a hell of a lot of problems from hormones to the way the body recovers to the way the body will um, reproduce and, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's not just the fitness that's the problem, it's then the food that comes along with the fitness. Because if you're constantly on negative calories, there becomes a point where the body burns out, your body becomes catabolic, your body, your body starts breaking itself down. Um, and that's a pretty destructive place to be at. I think you'd, you, you would probably die quicker from an obsessive fitness disorder than you would an alcohol disorder. Wow. That's interesting. In my opinion. So there's yeah. a line, obviously, where exercising, trying to eat right is beneficial. Yeah. But it can go too far, is what you're saying. 100%. I think there's a line with, with everything in life. Yeah. But I think when, when you're utilizing and using the body, then it, then it does become a lot more um, troublesome. Mm. Okay. So you're in this bad place. You say you start bodybuilding not long after that. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like it really helped you get out of that bad place. It did. I mean, it, it gave me a purpose and an objective once more. It gave me a fresh challenge. It gave me something to, to sort of go towards. Now, it's, it's interesting when people say that you, you started or you did or, you, or, or whatever, bodybuilding. It wasn't necessarily bodybuilding. I never did the competition. Yeah. But I did train as a bodybuilder yeah. as such. But my thing was never about wanting to get on stage. It was never about wanting to be a bodybuilder. My thing was never about that. It was always about trying to be different from everyone else. Mm, and at, okay. the, at the time where I kind of fell in love with, with the whole bodybuilding scene was before it became popular. Now, this, was, this is going back 22, 23 years now. And it was, it was nowhere near as mainstream as what fitness is now. And for me, it kind of felt like the only time I achieved anything in life was when I physically worked hard for it. Mm. And as I'd given up with sport, I remember sat there, sitting there thinking, the only thing I am good at is training. The only thing I am good at is following um, protocol and regime. And I am so different, even before the tattoos, I was so different from everyone else that I knew. My obsessiveness, my... Mm. I willing to be sacrificial on everything in life to be good at one thing was so different from anyone else. But I could only do that with anything physical. Okay. Oh, you put me in front of a book, I'll fall asleep. Right. Like genuinely, after five minutes of reading, I'm I'm, I'm fast asleep. <laughs> and back in the days, information wasn't available through anything but text. We didn't have the luxury of podcasts. We didn't have the luxury of watching YouTube videos on educational uh, topics. So for me back then, it was if if you can't read and digest the words, what 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 do you do? You know, it was it was where do I go from here? And and for me, it was obvious from day one that I had to be in or around fitness because it was where I excelled. It was kind of where where I came into the real me. You know, okay. the the, the the normal life just didn't work. Um, I, I couldn't do a nine to five in an office. It just wasn't, it yeah. wasn't where I was at. So I knew if I was going to go into fitness and I was going to be good, I needed to be different. I needed to stand out. I needed to, to really sort of make a splash in the water and people to be, so I suppose shocked by my presence. And, and that's what I did, to be honest. It was like, oh, I just wanted to create something so different and so bizarre um, that, no one could surpass it or, or, or come anywhere near it. And for me, I do genuinely think at one point in my life, I was probably, I was probably one of the biggest people in the world. Like okay. I was huge at one point. I was absolutely humongous. I mean, I think I'm at what, maybe 130 kilo, 135 kilo at the moment. At my biggest in shape, I was probably around about 160, 165 wow. in shape, not just chunky big like, Strong Manny Big, I mean, lean. yeah, and I looked huge, stupid, but huge. <laughs> you don't exactly look small now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. And, and 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 this is me small and healthy, this is me okay, fit, right? Um, and and you know, I, I, I then I then got to a stage where I, I realized that do you know what? I've created this image and this brand which I walk around with 
maybe there's something else I could do with this. Mm. Maybe it's not just fitness. And and I did, I excelled very, very quickly in the fitness world. And I became very renowned around the area for being a very good trainer. And and again, I was a walking billboard, which yeah. which which helped. I didn't have to advertise. Everyone knew exactly who I was and what I did. Um, it, it was so simple to get clients. I walked into a gym. Yeah. That was it. And heads would turn and people would talk and they'd watch me train someone. And it was kind of like, well, that's the only person that can train you if you want to get results. Mm. And that was the first time I realized how important it was to self-brand okay. and to have an identity. Um, and a lot of people will say to me now, it's like, do you, do you get frustrated that you're typecast in a film? And I'm like, no, it's the best, it's the best thing to be because it guarantees me work. Yeah. And I am so strongly identified as the bad guy. Yeah. Which for me is, is great because it means I'm, I have an identity. And I am recognized and it, and it has been on purpose that this has been created. Like the way, the way I talk and the way I'd look without being big and shaved head and tattoos, I wouldn't get the role. Mm. So there was definitely a part of me that kind of wanted to go down this, um, alter ego of myself and create this image and, and look, and I don't think it was so much of a, um, self-destructive way or, or, or in a sense of trying to be something I'm not, just more a, an expression of how I thought I could become successful, mm. if that makes sense. And I thought if I was to use all of the tools that I had to stand out from the crowd, then that would put me in, in front of the crowd. When did you first, where, where did that first acting gig come about? Was that someone spotting you or is that something that you actively pursued and how long so sort of after it's kind started? of a combination of both in all honesty so uh my friend's an actor and i've known him for a good few years and he's gone in to to see his agent and back in the day an agent was very similar to going to the job center Okay. You know, you kind of walk in there, you meet someone, you talk to them, you tell them what you want to do, you you look at the, the available jobs and you he suggests you for jobs. So it was, that's that's pretty much how an agency works. Um, so he'd gone in to, to speak to his agent about some films and he was an action actor. And he's looking through and he says, well, we've got this, we've got this. And, and a role was advertised for a part of the, the main villain in a James Bond, uh, I think it was Spectre. Mm. Uh, and they wanted sort of six foot two plus tattoos. <laughs> so my friends turned around to his agent and says, look, I've got the perfect guy for that. I said, He's not an actor, but he- So you already had the tattoos before you became an yeah, actor? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He said he'd be perfect for that role. And he showed him a picture and Joe, the, the agent looks here and says, uh, you got a number? And he phoned me up and he said, I'm, a, I'm an agent from London, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got a very good agency. I work with some great actors and, I think I could create you into in, in, into something quite special in the industry if you're interested. Well, I'd already done a couple of a couple of acting sessions, okay. Like recently to to this. Um, so you were thinking phone about call. it. I was already thinking about it, and yeah. Scott, the the guy, knew I was mm -hmm. I was thinking about trying to get into the acting world, which is why he suggested me. And uh, I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." Within. Three or four days, I was down in London to do this audi audition for James Bond. I was rubbish. <laughs> I was terrible. As we all are when we do something for the so first time. So terrible. Yeah. Uh, I walked in, I did the uh, audition, but I actually forgot every single word on the lines. <laughs> there was no way I'd got that part. And I, I apologized to them for wasting their time. They just laughed. They went, just go away. Just keep working. You've got a great look. Yeah. Go away. Work on your acting come back in six, 12 months and try again, like with a different film, but mm. you, you know, you've definitely got something looks wise. So I did, I went away. I phoned up, I phoned up Joe. I says, don't ever put me in for an audition again. I'm not interested. I felt like an absolute idiot. Um, thank you for the opportunity, but it's not me. I went away. And then I sat there and I thought, you know what? I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice and I'm going to become good at this, but I need to go. I need to go back to college or university. There's no way I can do this on my own. Okay. So that's exactly what I did. I went to, uh, I went to a friend of mine who was actually a drama teacher and at the age of 32, went back to college, which was difficult, you know, from having my own business. Yeah. 
and having people working for me to go in, I'm going to stop being a personal trainer. I'm going to give up X amount of hours a week and I'm going to go back to college with 16, 17 year olds that haven't got a clue how to to wipe their own backside, never mind bloody live as an adult, <laughs> and sat in a room with them. And I was massive at the time, mate. I was like 146, 147 kilo, full of tattoos, skinheads, sat there wow. with students that looked like they were 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was just so humiliating, but so exciting at the same time. So I'd done a couple of these classes, and I remember thinking, I can't do this. Like, this is... This is just so difficult because I felt so stupid mm. being there in the first place. And then it's such a different world going into the acting world. Like some of the warm ups that you do before you do a, before you do um, rehearsals or so on. Like you walk around a room, and then the teacher might say, "Okay, now I want you to pretend that the room is full of honey, and the honey is all on your feet." <laughs> and now there's loads of there's loads of flour and the flour's sticking on you and you've got to try and express the f <laughs> I'm standing there. I'm like, come on, I've done close protection. I've done door work. I've been in some naughty situations. I'm, I'm working as a trainer and I'm, I'm 32 years old, mate. I ain't, I ain't about to walk around a room pretending to be stuck with me. <laughs> so that It'd be me, funny to see. It was, but... yeah, it probably, it, 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 I just sat down. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of, trying to force myself to do something knowing that it was going to be horrendous but mm. good at the end of it so that's that's kind of where that college college uh, came to but luckily for me after about three weeks of being there i got another phone call off his agent who said there's a job come available uh well there's a there's a audition for a job which is available it's hbo it's a really big opportunity it's a huge project it's got ray winston as the lead it's gonna be shot in south africa it's David and Goliath. They want you to play Goliath. Would you go for an audition? I said, no way. Not after last time. <laughs> he said, no, it's good. It's really good. Like they really want you. And I've told them you've got no acting experience. They're going to talk you through the audition. Okay. So he said, it's worth going because I think you're going to get it. And I did. I landed the job. Um, and that was the first time I ever worked, which was about seven, eight years ago. And then what I did, I used that money from the first film, which was incredible compared to what I was used to. Mm. I used it to, to educate myself within acting and, and I I worked on dialogue, uh, dialects. I worked with coaches on how to become an actor, how to act, how to just, just everything about acting, whether it be physical, whether it be verbal, whether it be um, fight scenes and, and just put money back into myself. And I was able to stop working as a trainer for, what I thought was going to be about six months while I re-educated myself. Um, and I landed another job. So I got a bit more money. Mm -hmm. was able to not work for 12 months. Then I landed something within the fitness industry, which gave me a, a sponsorship, which allowed me to quit work full time and focus solely on acting. And eight years later, I've now landed my first lead roles in films. So it was a, it was a, a ladder that's definitely went in the right direction. Yeah, very interesting journey. When you're working as a personal trainer before you got into acting, were you thinking, I know at some point you started thinking about getting into acting, but were you thinking, you know, this is me. I'm going to be a personal trainer for yeah. the next 20 years and I'm okay with that? I was okay with it. You know, I really enjoyed being a personal trainer and, and this is what's really weird. So the gym that I worked at, well, I, I owned, so I... When I was 21, I, I decided that's what I was going to do. And, and I mm. went back to university, did a couple of courses, um, diploma and so on, to become a trainer. And I worked within a gym for about six months. And I realized soon that that wasn't me. Like okay. working for someone else was not me. Right. I can't be told what to do. I can't. <laughs> not out of... Um, not out of vanity or out of ego. It was... I just... I'm just not that person at all i need to be in control of my own self i need to be able to set my own rules and my own boundaries and and i am a hard worker it's not like i didn't want to get out of work i just kind of felt i don't i don't like being trapped i don't like being yeah. told what time where and when like it's a, it's a real issue i have which i think i might need to see a doctor about <laughs> it's so it's generally some of my some of my personality traits do do 
do tick the boxes for certain things. Um, and, and, and for me, it's kind of like, I, I do see it as a superpower and not a hindrance, but there's definitely something not wired up correctly with me. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was, when I was working as a trainer, I, um, I decided after about six months, I needed my own place. Mm. So I, I went and got this old spray yard, which was on a, um, it was on an industrial estate. I was 21, 22 years ago. And uh, I still own it today. Okay. Um, it's uh, as soon as acting started to do really well, like seven, eight years ago, I, I didn't work out there anymore. Yeah. But um, I closed it down and I've kept it for me. And it's my own personal gym now. Wow. And yeah, it's it, it's one of those things where I don't think I'll ever sell it mm. because it's where I started. And to go in there, it just brings back memories like it was yesterday. Yeah. But I, I've got to I've got to admit, I was in there yesterday and I was doing. Um, I had a couple of friends there who I've known for twenty years now. I've got members that still come and use it on their own. Yeah. That have been there for twenty years. Only only a handful, but seeing them last night, I hadn't seen them for a while. And I thought, I'd, I'd love to do it again. Okay. Obviously not for the money. Yeah. But just because I miss having all of my friends in one space, the energy of being in the gym, it's kind of like a therapy session for men. Mm. Do you know? I mean, obviously women can go in there as well, but my gym was definitely a man's gym. It yeah. was a spit and sawdust. Uh, you know, it was back in the day when weight training was very male dominated. Yeah. Um, but it was a lovely place. It was a lovely space to be. It was just a room full of friends, pushing weights, hitting a bag, having fun, having a chat. And I would have been very happy being a trainer for the rest of my life, 100%, because I was just, I was going to work with my friends every single day. But it didn't excite me. Yeah. It was comfortable. Sounds like you were content with yeah. what you were doing. I was very content. I was very comfortable. I enjoyed the job. Yeah. But it didn't satisfy the ambition that I have inside. I think a lot of people want that balance. They want to feel like they're in a place with their career where they do feel comfortable to some extent with yeah. what they're doing. They feel mm -hmm. competent. But then they also want that element of pushing themselves and trying to do something new and develop. And I think for me, I, when I decided to that I wanted to become an actor and I set that level um, where I did, everyone thought I was crazy. Mm. Like, absolutely. But I quit work. Yeah. I quit work before my first job. <laughs> and people were kind of going, you have in a midlife crisis, a break. And, and, and I, I could have been. But I, I, I decided that if I don't do it now, I had no money, I had no house, I had no mortgage. I just had a child, which... It was probably a mad time to do it. Mm. Um, and I remember saying to my partner, I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose. If it doesn't work, I'm still in the same position now. Go back to what you were doing before. As I was before. So it's not really a gamble. Yeah. Okay, I might be a couple of hundred pound a week short, but I'll make it somehow. I just need to try and do something. And, and, and I set stupidly ambitious goals. And I've not done too bad. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot of people are actually in that scenario where they don't have as much to lose as they think they do 100%. by going for it. They can most likely go back to what they were doing previously, 100%. but sort of talk themselves into, oh, I can't, the risk is too high. And I, I think people move. use the word risk because they're lazy. And that sounds really obnoxious and, and bad, but I get it. I, I, I do think that like, I have a lot of friends. I'd love to do that, but I'd love to do this, but oh, I can't do that because of this. I'm like, you, you, you're not doing it because you don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. Like you're making excuses not to do it. We we spoke briefly before about how do you train when you're living such a crazy lifestyle? Because yeah. because to me, that's a priority. And how do you learn lines? How do you do this? How do you do that? Because it's a priority. And you you, mm. you have, I don't want to say we all have the same 24 hours because it's we don't, but we do all have time that yeah. we can say, right, well, I spend X, Y, and Z wasting time mm. on the phone you know when you look at screen time on phones which i do often for other people within my household it's monstrous you're talking five six hours a day yeah and yeah. okay you might not be five six hours a day glued to your phone but you're five six hours a day distracted from doing something else mm. do you know and and yep. then five or six hours of non-productive work 
will be the difference between success and failure. And and to me, I don't think I don't think enough people understand the dangers of today's world. And I don't mean the dangers of being murdered. I mean the dangers of distraction and the dangers of failure through not being present and being distracted by nonsense. I mean, as someone who's aware of that, do you still find it difficult yourself to not be distracted? It depends where I am. Okay. And who I'm with. Um, see, for me, if I'm on my own, I am brilliant with time. I have no issues because I will just turn the phone off and turn it on when I need it. And I will allocate and set alarms constantly through the day. Okay. And, and that's how I get everything in. It's yeah. very selfish. It's, very, it's a very different way to live, but it's productive as hell. Mm. I, can, I can do as much work in one day as, as I'd normally do in a week if I was at home. Because when I'm at home, I need to consider the kids, the wife, the, mm. the, the, my parents, the light, all of that. And before you know it, you're kind of down to like four hours a day of productive work rather than being on your own. You've got 12 to 14 hours a day mm. with no distractions. And, and I think the biggest problem, what I'm trying to do at the moment with my kids is to make them less, um, make them more aware of people and less time spent on gadgets. Yeah. Because I think it's such a bad place to be. And, and it's such an easy distraction for parents to put the YouTube on or put TV on. Yeah. I know it's, I know we're filming for YouTube. This isn't me <laughs> saying, don't watch YouTube. This it's is, not never, but it's this. Well, no, yeah. no, this is, this is me saying be selective hmm. with how you spend your time. Yeah. Because there's a very big difference between watching something, something informative on you. I spend probably probably eight to ten hours a week on YouTube, mm. right? And my search history will be acting, training, or nutrition, or topics yeah. of interest that will benefit my career. Yeah, fantastic platform for that. But then the problem becomes when you're Oh, I'm just going to click on this page. Oh, I'm just going to click on Facebook. Oh, I'm just going to click on it. Oh, my WhatsApp's connected to this as well. I've got a message from blah, blah, blah. I need to go back to him. So you may start off watching something of educational purpose. But if you have your social media networks all connected, if you have distractions available on that, on that gadget or whether it be an iPad or a computer or whatever, you're not focused on what you're watching then. Because you're replying to a message, then you're coming back, and then you're watching five more minutes, then you're replying to another message, then you're going to scroll through Facebook. Then you get this ad that's targeted to get your interest anyway, which is another distraction. So for me, it's if you can be aware and present in what, in what you're doing and be selective in how you are spending your time, you'll become successful. It's not a coincidence it really isn't, but it's trying to understand the importance of being present in, in every moment. Hmm. This might sound like a bit of a bizarre question, but do you enjoy acting? Do you enjoy yeah, being on absolutely set? love it. Like okay. there is no other feeling that gives you that excitement. Really? Yeah, really, really. Honest to God. Um, don't get me wrong. The first couple of years petrified okay absolutely petrified i i remember walking out for the the first job i did which was in south africa in a place called um oh, oh it was in, i can't remember where it was now it was just outside cape town anyway we've drove down there uh stellenbosch and okay we've yeah. drove we've drove down there and there's this massive field and there must have been two thousand extras <laughs> <laughs> there was a, and it was just a few it was the first time i'd seen a proper film set yeah and i opened the trailer door and you've got all these extras and then you've got the cameras you've got the light you've got the sound you've got producers you've got directors you've got ray winston next to you singing and i'm going i, I don't i don't want to be here <laughs> too, is, yeah too much pressure this too intense. is ridiculous 
ridiculous. And to top it off, I'm wearing a pair of pants and and, and a <laughs> dead goat strapped around my chest and I look like an absolute sausage. So you you kind of... I don't think any actor... Well, I, it's difficult. I think if an actor's been through drama school and has been through the proper steps, it's probably a lot less stressful. For someone like myself that's thrown into the deep end and, and kind of told to learn to swim, it's petrifying. Mm. It really is. It doesn't matter how confident you are as a person. Yeah. It's going to hit you because I'm very confident, but it comes from preparation. Mm. If I can prepare, I'm confident. And, and evidence. Yeah. Once you've got evidence that you are good at something, mm -hmm. you're naturally going to feel a lot yeah, more confident. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. So if I can if I can walk into somewhere with those two, I'm good. With the first couple of films, I didn't know what to prepare or how to prepare. I didn't know how to act or, or what I should be doing. So that was scary. I didn't know how to read the script. I had no idea how to read a, a call sheet. Uh, and it, everything was just so big. It was, and, and your anxiety was through the roof. But you learn and you slowly develop and then eventually you kind of lose those nerves and those nerves turn into excitement and then the excitement turns into an adventure and and then you, it's down the same rabbit hole that I was before where it's kind of, well, I actually enjoy doing this because I'm I'm definitely getting better and I'm, I'm getting praise and not only has the director said I was good and the producers said I was good and the other actors have said I was good. My mum and dad are here and they're, they're smiling. They're saying I was good and I've got another film. And that's the enjoyable part. Okay. It's the, it's kind of, if we go to you in your life, something that you've done, that you've got the result for. So for instance, mm. if you were selling houses and you've got the sale, it's that moment of, I made that happen. And then you've done another one. You've done another, it's, it's, it's that self realization that you've achieved something worth value. And that feeling of progress. As yeah. Well. And pride. Yeah. And, and something that not everyone can do. Yes. That is another thing, you know, you, you step on there and especially my parents are like, oh God, I don't know how you do that. I don't know, I don't know how you sit in front of people. I don't know how you've done that accent. I don't know how you, how you can do it. How do you remember those lines? How, and you just sit there and go, well, because I'm good. Well, in reality, it's hard work and it's it is iterating and, and it, getting better. It really is. Yeah, it's it's like anything, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that you can train and the more you practice, the better you become. Yeah, because I know a lot of creative people often don't actually enjoy that much the act of creating their art or whatever it is they're doing, but they might really enjoy the the effect afterwards or what they've created at the end yeah, of it. So that's why I wanted to ask about whether you actually so, enjoy being on set. And all so that I love stuff. being on set. Yeah, I love the the process of of acting. I hate watching it back. <laughs> okay, yeah, and that's the weird part. And it's not so much because. I'm not sure whether it's because I'm so bored of the film by the time I finished it because I've mm. shot yeah. so many takes and so many of this, or if it's a a watching it back and going, I would have done that so differently now because I actually filmed that 12 months ago or 18 months ago. And as an actor, I've developed so much in those last 18 months that I'm cringing at where I was then. Yeah. So I think it's probably a, a mixture of both, but I enjoy the... The, the here and now and the learning from the here and now mm -hmm. that really excites me and then get getting the opportunity to go back and practice it again and again but the the biggest problem with acting is that you can't do it on your own yeah okay you can't do it constantly and there's a difference between us filming this and and, and doing a scene now to go in and doing a scene on a huge Hollywood budget film. Yeah. Because it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. You could practice 
dialogue. You could practice emphasizing words. You could practice whatever you want. And this is this is kind of the setup that we would use in rehearsals for a film. Mm. You know, the, the actors would be sat like this and there'd be a drama teacher there. The camera might be on so the director can see how the scene plays out. Um, and you, you definitely you definitely run this in a room very similar to this. Yeah. But it's not the same. Yeah. Um, an interesting part of your personal brand is the tattoos. You mentioned mm -hmm. them briefly. And you said you got those before you started acting. Yeah. Did you get them, particularly the ones sort of around your face and your hair? Did you get those to help with acting or just yeah. something you want to do anyway? No, not at all. Um, I didn't have these anywhere. These these came on way before I even considered doing acting as a okay. as a profession. Why? Because, I mean, that's quite a... Yeah, it's brave. Yeah. So I got these before anyone was really getting tattoos as well. Mm. This wasn't... You know, tattoos have become very trendy the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. I've had these since I was 21, 22. So we're talking wow. 20 years now. Okay. Um, I'd never seen anyone with a face tattoo before I'd got one. Yeah. Um, it was complete self-destructive mode. <laughs> okay. Do you know what it was? It was me going, well... I've been at the absolute bottom of the bottom trying to do everything right. Now I'm just going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And when I was told that this was a stupid idea, do you know, you know, the funniest thing is, right? I remember I was, I was working in the gym and I had a, a family I used to train, group train, and they were lovely. They were really nice. They were typical, just a typical family. Like, you yeah. Know? And the mom, she was about 60 at the time. She came up to me, she went, oh God, Martin, I'm so worried about you. I don't know, I don't know what you, I had a tiny tattoo at the arm. <laughs> You're going to ruin your life. No one's going to hire you for a job if you get that, if you keep getting these tattoos. Oh, and she, uh, I'd come in every week and I'd have had a new tattoo. I just went through a phase <laughs> of tattoos every week. So I used to train my tattoo artist. And in return for training him, he used to give me free tattoos. Right, yeah. Hence why I got so many so quick. And every week I'd come in and she'd be like, oh, I can't believe you put that on your hand. Oh, I can't believe you've done that. <laughs> anyway, I got this one on my face. Oh, she went absolutely <laughs> mental. And I remember her standing there and she was almost crying like this woman loved me. We were really, really, I'd known her for about four or five years. And uh, she was nearly crying. She's like, you're just never going to get a job. <laughs> never going to get a job you've you've just killed your chances of a career I just I don't know what you're going to do and that was about five years ago six no it was that would have been about eight nine years ago yeah and it was the funniest funniest thing because I remember saying to her I never want to work for anyone anyway so I don't care okay didn't didn't bother you didn't bother me. And the irony is, of course, it probably really helps you get jobs now, right? 100% it, it helps. Gives you the look for it's the identity. roles you're after. Yeah. It's identity. And, and, and it's, you know, if you if you see me and you don't know who I am, you can find out even seconds. Yeah. I have so many people come up to me going, oh, I didn't realize it was you. I put on the internet, big tattooed man, you came yeah. up straight away. <laughs> of course, yeah. It's great for branding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's not so good for crime. <laughs> Do you regret any of them? No, no. I don't. I don't regret anything at all because I'm in a great place. Mm. No, no. And I think for me, every everything has a, a purpose and a reason. And everything I went through and everything I've done has has got me here. And what does the future hold? It's madness. Absolute <laughs> madness. So a lot of people would think that was maybe not what they were aiming for, but that's what you like. Yeah. No. I, I, you like the chaos. Not so much chaos, but living, living out your fantasy and your dreams. Yeah, and the excitement. I should probably say instead of yeah, chaos, just surreal. Mm. You know. So the weekend, I was, I was in this gorgeous hotel in Amsterdam with Jason Statham, sat there and talking to him like I've known him all my life. <laughs> and we just looked at each other. He's like, "We got to we, when we're doing a film," and we were chatting away. And I'm like, "Yeah, we'll do one." And he's like, "Yeah, we we'll definitely do one. We'll have a look." And to me, those memories and those times, you kind of think no one else gets that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm sat in this private hotel in Holland with two very good good friends of mine. And there was the, the guy over the table, Rico, had just won 
heavyweight championship of the world in front of about 30,000 people. I went into the ring after giving him a big, big hug, looked around, he's like, this is one big arena. <laughs> and, you know, he's a superstar in his own right. Yeah. And he's gone and done all his press after. We've gone back to the hotel and then the next morning, me, him, and uh, Jason have gone for breakfast and I'm sat there and you're like, this, this right here is, is what life is about. It's, it's not about the money. It's not about, it's about having experiences that no one else gets mm. because you've worked your ass off to get there. And, awesome. and that for me is what the future holds is being, being in a, in a position that I can experience opportunities, whether it be with people or in situations or, um, that not everyone can, you know, the first day I went to Australia and walked onto the film set and, and I saw my, my, you know, Shao Kahn was the lead actors in the film and I saw the set and I was like, Oh my God, that's for me. Well, that's, that's <laughs> mine. <laughs> like this is a Warner Brothers studio and that's, it's mine there. And That's you're just awesome. walking down and you've got all the screen, the, the, the stages and you, you, you walk past the first one and you're like, whoa, that's huge. And you look in, you realize that's, that's for the film. And then you go to the second one, like, whoa, that's even bigger. <laughs> oh, that's for me as well. And then you keep walking, you keep walking and you FaceTime your mom. And you're like, you ain't going to believe this. And you're just like, oh, look at that. <laughs> that to me is, is what the future holds. And it's the, it's the surrealness and the excitement. And we've, you know, I've had a fantastic year. I've had an absolutely incredible year last year. And I finished on Mortal the end of January. And uh, I was like, right, I'm going to have a couple of months off. Like I worked all year mm. in between Rome and, and Australia filming. And, and like I said, not bad places to be well, phenomenal jetting places, between. Yeah, yeah. And phenomenal. And you know, you get spoiled, you get absolutely sport rotten. These were big productions. And um, I, I, I sat at home and it was so funny. I got a phone call off my agent. It's like, you, uh, you've you got a meeting with a director tomorrow and uh, he really likes you and uh, looks like you're going to be working again. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like you, you do and don't want to you could i definitely wanted it like i i am so <laughs> excited to start this new project but it was it's just madness that i'm living the life i'm living from where i came from mm. i think that's that's an awesome story and i i really like speaking to people that are excited about what they're doing and also ambitious and willing to talk about their ambitions i think particularly in this yeah. country people tend to downplay stuff and hide it and it's like yeah no, if you really want to go do cool stuff like yeah no for it. me for me that's what life's about mm. it's not about showing it off yeah and it's not it's about difference. taking it for granted it's about appreciating what you get but also being proud enough to say i work hard for that yeah yeah i'm not going to be ashamed because i get to travel here yeah. and do that because it took me 25 years to get there mm. And, you know, if you want to, if you want to think of me as being egotistical because I'm going to enjoy it, then that's your, that's your issue, not mine. Yeah. But I will enjoy every last thing that I do because one life is short and two, you're not guaranteed to, to continually have success. Yeah. So I think enjoying it while it lasts is important. And I think taking it all in, um, and sharing it with the world. You know, the one, the one thing I will say is I'm not, I don't see myself as a fitness influencer, but I would like to be an influencer to people in the sense of showing them my journey and what I have said a lot of negative and nasty things about social media. But what I will say positive is that anyone who has followed me from the start would have followed me from before all this started. Yeah. And they have seen from me being a personal trainer that just got spotted on the internet for being huge, kind of like where that Sam kid is. Yeah. Right. From there to becoming a sponsored athlete, to becoming an actor, to now doing lead roles. They've gone through that whole, and, and my children. I've had two, two more children since all of this started. And they've gone through the whole journey of me being basically in a, in a rented house into buying my first home, into buying businesses, into opening the X, Y, and Z. Mm. They've seen that success journey firsthand. Yeah. And I, I do have regularly people message me going, 
I've followed you for 10 years. I can't believe where you are now. And I'm so happy to see you here. And I'm so, because I think you can, the one thing with social media is if you are honest, you do feel a connection to someone. I think that's, we talked about Sam Sulek earlier. I think that's why he's exploded. He's so authentic in what mm -hmm. he creates and it comes through. I think one thing that's also really interesting about your story that's, I think a lot of people tend to assume that people will either have the massive success that they have in their career when they're 18, 19, 20, like it's destined from day one. And that's not the path that everyone no, goes on. Some people, they, and, and you've done that, you know, you've had massive success in recent years. And before that you did all this other stuff. Well, I, I, you know, I was having this conversation on Sunday with Jason. Right. Because he, he'd never made it into the film industry until he's, uh, in, in his thirties. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of people think it happens overnight. He, he told me he was working five, six years, couldn't get a job. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's the same as people say to me, oh, you, you've exploded. I was like, well, exploded? It took me eight years. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, a slow trudge. Yeah. And then, and then before that exploded, I was training for 10 years in the, in yeah. the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't explode from anywhere. Which I've, is all part of like, yeah, what you've the process. created. Yeah, yeah. The process, people, people see your success and think it's just happened overnight you know, this is this has been years in the making yeah. and and i don't want to keep going back to your favorite saying but it's the, same, <laughs> it's the same thing it's the same thing you know you know what gets results yeah but it's not easy yeah and if you're willing to refuse to fail you will succeed eventually and that that's why i said my superpower was failing when i was young mm. because i refused to feel like that again and that is is a feeling that I think because because I, it really hit me hard when I failed. It wasn't just upset. It was full on depression, eating yeah. disorder, the whole works. It was such a horrible, scary place to be that the idea of going anywhere near that again, for me, I'd rather die, yeah. you know? So it's kind of, well, if you fail at this, you're gonna feel like that. So do you want, do you want to try again? Yeah, I'll try again. Mm. And, and and that's, you know, eventually, if you keep knocking a door, the door's going to open. And that's that mindset you need. Fab. Well, thank you very much for coming to speak with me. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Anywhere you want to mention to send people, you might not want to send them to your socials, you might want to. <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. Go to the shops and buy your mum something nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Fab, well, Martin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. What did you think of my fascinating conversation with Martin? What did you learn? I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed that, you're going to love my interview with boxing legend Ricky Hatton. We talk about the fight game, steroids, and a whole lot more. You can check it out right here.